Hello everyone and welcome to this special Leadership Spotlight series brought to you by the World Green Building Council as part of World Green Building Week 2020. My name is Katrina Brady and I'm Head of Better Places for People, which is one of our global projects at the World Green Building Council. In support of this year's campaign, Act on Climate, the team at World GBC are delighted to bring you a series of conversations involving industry leaders already acting on climate to discuss the opportunities that net zero buildings present in addressing some of the most critical issues of our time. This year, we're calling on governments to implement policy to drastically reduce emissions from the building and construction sector. Throughout this week, our network is highlighting the action being taken by business, governments and green building councils to drive the uptake of net zero buildings, the benefits they bring for thriving and resilient economies, and the health of our planet and people. We know that our industry is ready to deliver to these standards across the mainstream, and bolder and more ambitious regulation is now required to unlock its full potential. So this Spotlight series will be hosted across this week by staff members of the World Green Building Council in conversation with industry experts related to this specific topic. Yesterday, we heard a fascinating dialogue led by our CEO, Christina Gamboa, about how we can build back better and calling for governments to consider climate action in their economic recovery efforts. Today, we're taking a more people-oriented perspective considering how we can enhance human health with net zero buildings. We have three more great sessions coming up this week, focused on net zero for communities, the planet and economies, embodied carbon, and finally net zero buildings restoring the health of the planet. So don't miss these great sessions where we'll continue to be joined by expert speakers from our network and industry, and you can also catch the recordings on the World GBC YouTube channel. So we are intending for today to be a very interactive session. We'd love you to get involved. You can get involved by submitting your questions to the panelists through the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll be keeping an eye on this throughout the session and we'll be bringing them in where we can. So don't wait to the end, get your questions in as soon as you think of them. You can share your involvement in our event by posting on social media using the hashtags below, hashtag Act on Climate, hashtag WGBW2020. Visit our World Green Building Week website to find out how you can learn, share and lead on net zero buildings. And there you can also find our call to action statement, calling for governments to implement policy for net zero buildings and submit an endorsement. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to introduce myself and the wonderful panelists that I am joined by today to discuss how we're going to enhance human health with net zero buildings. My name is Katrina Brady. I'm head of Better Places for People at the World Green Building Council. We're joined by Pascal Everard, who is the Director of Sustainable Business Development of the Sangoban Group a leading manufacturer and distributor of construction products. Pascal contributes to develop and implement Sangoban's strategy to foster the market transformation towards more sustainable construction and to support the group business units to develop more sustainable offers, particularly regarding carbon circularity and health and well-being. And Pascal has been actively involved in the Better Places for People campaign for many years now. Welcome Hello, everyone. Pascal. Thank you. Josh Jacobs is the Director of Environmental Codes and Standards for UL's Environment and Sustainability Division. In this role, he served as Chairman of the US Mirror Committee for the ISO 2400 Sustainable Procurement, has spoken about sustainable procurement on, and green building on five continents, and currently serves on US GBC's Lead Steering Committee is incoming 2021 Lead Steering Committee Chairman and as Vice Chair of ASHRAE 189.1. Welcome, Josh.
Next, we have Valentin Fortescue, is Senior Programme Management Officer in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Secretar Secretariat, Economy Division of the UN Environment Programme. Valentin has been active in the field of atmospheric environment since the 1990s, carrying out monitoring, modelling from global to local scales, integrated assessments, air and climate policy development and implementation, and he joined UNEP in 2015. And finally, Agustin Garcia is Head of Sustainability in Siemens Smart Infrastructure. He's in charge of designing decarbonisation roadmap of Siemens Smart Infrastructure to achieve sustainability targets alongside supply chain management and as well analysing the influence of health and wellbeing and sustainability in the whole Siemens Smart Infrastructure portfolio. Hi, good afternoon, Katrina. Thank you. Thank you. So a big thank you to all of our panellists for joining us here today and being part of this incredibly important and topical conversation. And of course, thank you to all of you who have joined us live today and for engaging in our World Green Building Week campaign. As I said, remember to share your questions and your comments throughout in the chat box, and we will be picking these up throughout the conversation. Okay, so before we go any further in this conversation, it would be remiss of me in a conversation centred around health and net zero buildings to not place this in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're approaching the winter months, but I'm sure for all of you listening from all over the globe, the effect of this disease on our lives, on society, on economy and our health in every sense of the word is really only continuing to grow. And placing this in terms of the built environment, we've recognised from our network across the world that our efforts both to mitigate the transmission of the disease and the fact that all of us across the world have spent so much time inside our buildings, particularly inside our homes, has really brought health and well-being to the forefront of our attention, both mental and physical health. As Christina Gamboa, our CEO, called for in yesterday's session, we believe that governments working to eliminate this pandemic and rebuild their economies should pair this recovery with climate action. And all of us together are aspiring for a society that prioritizes health for people and planet. And that brings me to the topic that's really underpinning today's conversation, which is health and well-being in the built environment, a topic that has really transformed, has come on so much in the last decade that we've got four experts sitting here to join the conversation today and is truly a multifaceted issue enc encompassing areas of our life across all areas that relate to the building and construction sector, whether that's indoor environmental quality and comfort, harmony with nature, the way our built environment and urban planning in cities and communities affects our lifestyle and behaviour choices, the social impact of the whole life cycle of building and construction and people impacted at all stages of the supply chain. And of course, the health impacts of climate change, which we must mitigate through the implementation of net zero carbon buildings, but also address, address resilience and adaptation challenges as well and other issues of resource depletion and wider environmental factors. So even with that, there's a huge amount, there's a huge spectrum of topics that we can cover in today's conversation. So we will get on with it shortly, but I do want to highlight that the World GBC will be publishing innovative new research under our new framework uh, through the World Green Building Council's Health and Wellbeing Framework being launched on the 4th of November this year. So please do stay tuned if you're interested in this topic for more information coming soon from World GBC channels about how you can be involved in the launch of that framework and pick up the tool when it's available. So let's get started with the conversation. I'm so pleased to be here with you all today to ensure that we can have a conversation about how we advance our net zero and health priorities in a united way. And let's start with a nice general question. Let's talk about a decarbonized built environment. Why is a decarbonized built environment important for our climate goals? How does human health fit into that? And how are your respective organizations driving this conversation forwards. Valentin, I'll, I'll come to you to start, if I may. 
Thank you, Katriona. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be in this uh, panel, and, and hopefully we can can have um, a discussion later on. First of all, we have two visions to merge here. We have the vision of the Paris Agreement, and we also have the Sustainable Development Goals vision of equitable climate action, um, reducing the carbon footprint, but also other footprint of, of pollution of buildings as well, uh, which we believe will be at the center of actions to mitigate the impacts of climate change and, and pollution in general. Uh, the built environment is actually responsible for um, approximately 40% of the global carbon emissions. And that is a lot. Um, zero carbon buildings can create those significant benefits for both um, reducing the impact on climate but also reducing uh, the energy poverty uh, strengthening energy resilience of course improving uh, human health but uh, also improving the energy access for, for and, and improving that energy access is at the center of basically uh, all development policies we also believe, uh, I represent the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Secretariat, which is hosted by the United Nations Environment Program. And um, we believe uh, uh, in our constituency that uh, the cities will be the lead actors in shifting the world toward decarbonized building sector. Um, with a projected 68% of the world population uh, to live in urban areas by 2050, we can imagine that cities will basically determine the, the future of their countries. And action in cities will need to happen and will be um, the defining uh, type of action. We also think that actors at different government levels and also the public and private sectors will need to come together. And this is uh, one way of, of coming together uh, today to discuss, but there is more to be followed by action, of course. To overcome all those barriers and to make also um, the, the net uh, ZCB uh, a feasible goal. I think zero business is, is, is feasible. Um, we will talk about later probably also about uh, not only uh, zero carbon but also other pollutants that uh, can come into question. Um, the way to achieve that uh, we believe is um, through different combinations of energy efficiency measures, very important, as well as um, the use of renewable energy and again uh, um, the use of, of renewable energy has to uh, merge or marriage um, um, the, uh, both climate change but also um, air pollution um, uh, goals in terms of uh, 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 mitigating both. And, uh, and also as a last resort, we will uh, probably uh, need to also consider uh, carbon offsets for the sector. Many of, uh, of the pollutants in our building damage, as we said, both the climate but and the natural environment. They also damage our damage our health. And um, uh, without throwing some big numbers, which I usually hate to do, but in this particular case, I think it's valid to say that um, air pollution is 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 estimated to uh, to take about seven million lives prematurely every year. Uh, to diseases that are um, associated with both outdoor and household air pollution. So um, the role of the buildings in 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 in, in, in helping us to uh, to minimize this this impact is is very important here. To uh, and these tragic deaths, of course, they cost the global economy a, a tremendous amounts uh, and. Uh, uh, and also in, in uh, lost workforce productivity and, uh, and welfare losses. And this is a cost that is, is, um, is put on our society uh, year by year. So with, uh, with respect to COVID, of course, we, we may have become more aware of, of the costs of, 
of, um, of, of this type of crisis, but we are talking still about an, an ongoing crisis which has not found uh, the final solution. Air pollution is the, the, the largest um, environmental factor uh, that uh, is influencing human health. So I think I will stop here, not to take too much time from, from the other panelists to, to answer this question. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Valentin. Um, who, who wants to come in next? No, I, I can go next, uh, Agustin. Um, yeah, as, as Valentin said, um, yeah, a big portion of, of the emission, large portion of the emissions on the pollution is coming from, from buildings uh, that that's the fat, you know? And this is mainly happening due to many factors like the age of the buildings, the lack of efficiency in the usage of the buildings, uh, and either regarding space efficiency or energy or malfunctions or bad performance of, of the equipment. Uh, but obviously, um, yeah, all these factors have an impact in indoor air quality and ventilation and occupancy levels that influence directly in health and, and well-being of users and visitors. So that's that's why we truly believe the two concepts of decarbonization and energy usage and, and indoor quality and well-being is, is, uh, is closely linked. Uh, in, in our organization in Siemens, what we think, and, and I think what we will discuss uh, afterwards, is that digitalization and innovation will have a key role to improve all these conditions. And as well, um, it will help us to, for companies and corporates to create new business opportunities that really uh, increase, or the, uh, sorry, decrease emissions and increase uh, uh, air quality, indoor air quality. I can take the floor, yeah, so maybe. Back... Oh. Go ahead, Pascal. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I take the floor. So just uh, uh, maybe a, a few uh, additional points to, to what has been said and uh, just uh, to say that, yes, definitely uh, th there is a link between energy and in buildings and, uh, and health and well-being for, for people. Just a few data for, 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 for Europe. Uh, we know that 11% of the population is not able to, to warm, to keep their, their homes properly warm. And, uh, and, and there is a clear link between uh, the poorest uh, housing status and the highest excess uh, winter mortality. So clearly, if you can address uh, fuel poverty, if you can uh, allow people to afford uh, thermal comfort, you will uh, solve uh, lots of, uh, of diseases and, uh, and decrease the mortality level. Uh, we know also that 80 million people in Europe live in damp houses, and, and this is caused by uh, by uh, poor insulation and bad ventilation. And again, this causes uh, resp respiratory illness, illnesses uh, that cost a lot to, to the society. Um, and we know also that uh, the exposure of children to mold is responsible for lots, lots of asthma uh, crisis, for, for instance. So solving this issue of uh, energy poverty, of fuel poverty, uh, improving the thermal comfort inside uh, buildings will deliver a lot in terms of uh, health and, uh, and well-being for, for people. So as a manufacturer of, uh, of construction product and more specifically of uh, uh, building envelope solutions that deliver energy efficiency, uh, we, we, we believe that we have a role to play as a manufacturer, but it's a role that we can't play alone. Uh, and that's why it's nice to see that uh, we can have uh, such a round table with different uh, stakeholders, because we believe that uh, the market transformation will only happen if we are able to co cooperate properly across the entire value chain. Uh, this is quite a systemic change. So it's not just about uh, uh, architects or manufacturers delivering proper solutions. It's, uh, it's an entire transformation of the building chain to properly deliver what is at stake. And uh, solutions exist, but now we need to, to, to transform uh, into a reality. So again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, it, it, all incredibly interesting points. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it to something else. So here's our issue. Over the last you know 30, 40 years, a lot of the HVAC systems and building envelopes that Pascal is talking about, we've done a fairly decent job in the developed world, where most of our buildings are doing a lot of great 
work on saving energy, right? That operational energy side. And that's awesome, right? For a lot of the reasons that we've talked about. We've also done some stuff to address the indoor air quality. We could certainly do more on both of those sides. I do appreciate Valentin bringing in the fact that, you know, we've gotten kind of, in America, we have a saying, you can't get blood from a stone anymore because a lot of the HVAC, um, we've gotten down to levels that we need new technology to actually get to lower levels. So we're going to need greener energy providing solutions, right? But now, as Katrina, you mentioned, with COVID-19 and global pandemics, most of our research is now showing us that we need ventilation, right? So Augustine's indoor air quality is hugely important, right? We need to flood as much air, outdoor air, into our systems which is going to increase our energy use, which is opposite of our net zero goal. So as we transition to greener energy, we need to offset that from somewhere else. And that's where Pascal comes in again, right? Where organizations like St. Gabon and lots of others around the world are now looking at their embodied carbon, what it takes to make the products in there. HVAC systems around the world, and it, 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 full disclosure, we've worked with most of them on a global basis have done incredible jobs on the operational energy saving side, but haven't always looked at their embodied, how much energy it takes to produce that HVAC system. Folks like St. Coban, folks like Siemens, lots of other organizations around the world are doing that now. They're looking at their embodied carbon, their supply chain carbon, because we've only been looking at 50% of the problem, right? In the next 30 years, 50% of our carbon problem is going to come from the embodied side because we're doing so well in the HVAC. So to bring health in, as COVID-19 solutions come about, which again, most of the data today, as we sit on September 22nd, 2020, says that it's increased ventilation. That's opposite of saving energy concepts. But that's fine as long as we start to bring some of the embodied carbon down and, as Valentin said, provide greener energy solutions at their source. So that's kind of how I would balance it now. Mm -hmm. If I may Thank say you. something, still, Josh, we, we, we have a, a huge potential of operational carbon to, to be saved, uh, especially when we look uh, in Europe at existing buildings. Uh, existing buildings are, are, are losing energy, wasting energy like hell. So there is a, still a huge potential to renovate and lower the operational uh, consumption. I fully agree with you that uh, embodied carbon is a growing topic and we need to have it properly addressed. But it would be a mistake to address only embodied carbon while forgetting about all the operational carbon that is still there. So it's, uh, it's making things even more uh, complex, but even more exciting as well. So we need know to work on both fronts, but yeah, they still actually, do exist. A hundred percent. It sounds like seven fronts, right? <laughs> um, but I completely agree that, that it, I always, we always do get focused on the new construction side, right? We, we always think new, new, new. What is it? 99.8% of the world's square footage is there from last year. So <laughs> agreed, there is lots of still operational savings, but I think we have that technology, Pascal, right? We, we know yeah, what yeah. to do. Right, yeah. So yeah. Uh, between Augustine, um, you know, ventilation correctness, you guys and saving the envelope, I think we know how to solve that, how we solve our, our, our supply chain carbon problem in manufacturing, that's still getting worked out. So yeah, agreed, it all needs to work in concert. Okay, there are so many great areas of conversation coming up. I want to explore them all, but let's put them in an order. First, I want to go back, if we may, to there was a point Pascal made that I think is really interesting that we should delve a little bit further in, and it was to put a name on it, this, this co-beneficial relationship that we can have between net zero buildings and human health. And then after that, let's switch it and pull up some of the points Josh mentioned about COVID. But thinking about the co-benefits, first of all, Pascal mentioned um, fuel poverty and energy efficiency. We're obviously a net zero building with a more thermally comfort em comfortable envelope that has lower energy requirements for heating a building or just comfort comfort energy use in general, that is a beneficial arrangement from both environmental and a, a social and health perspective. And that's one great example, but Pascal, I'll come back to you first and then go back to the rest of our speakers. Is there anything else we can add to this co-benefit argument? Any other ways that we can use health as a way to 
demonstrate social benefits of net zero buildings? Well, I think uh, coming back to, to, to the definition of, uh, of a net zero building, it was said by Valentin, it is first uh, a uh, highly energy efficient building. So it's a building that consumes very little. And in terms of design or renovation, it means that uh, you, you, you need to look at two very important aspects. First, you need to secure that you will have a well insulated and uh, airtight building envelope, both for the glazed and uh, opaque walls. And second, that you will have a, a very well uh, functioning and well controlled ventilation system, if mechanical or natural. And uh, beyond energy efficiency, actually, those two aspects are key to deliver uh, some, uh, some uh, comfort uh, elements. They are key to deliver thermal and, and acoustic comfort. They are key to deliver access to the light. And they are key also to, to deliver good indoor air quality. So uh, there is no compromise uh, between energy efficiency or comfort. Uh, by working on delivering more energy efficiency, actually you have the, the, the opportunity to deliver more comfort, health and well-being to the building's occupants. And this is uh, an approach that uh, we in Saint-Gobain have been developing over the last 15 years. We call it multi-comfort. And uh, actually, uh, it, it has proven to, to be uh, efficient to convince people to go for more energy efficiency measure when they were not convinced, or when people were only considering energy efficiency to say, and by the way, you will get more on the side of health, well-being and comfort, which is great. So I think these are two, uh, two sides of the same coin. You, you can't just separate uh, health and well-being and, uh, and energy efficiency. This comes together. And uh, it's a very strong message uh, to users, to investors, but also to policymakers. And, uh, and it has proven to, to deliver through uh, already lots of examples. As uh, George says, it's not new. So it's uh, already something that, is, uh, that has been uh, implemented in, uh, in, uh, in many projects. But I think it's something that, uh, that still deserves to be further explained, further demonstrated, and, and actually implemented in all buildings, in each and every buildings. Today, uh, for cost reasons, too often people start to compromise and do not uh, implement solutions that will uh, deliver at uh, the best level for energy efficiency and uh, health and well-being. And this is really a pity because what you save at construction time or renovation time uh, might be a loss over time. It's a loss for, 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 for the users, for the investors, but it's also a, a societal loss. Uh, and I think uh, we need to, to be more vocal on that. If I, if I may, um, I, I would agree with everything that was said here and also um, about um, the, the interplay between ventilation and humidity which is hugely important for comfort but also for the health and well-being um, of the people that are spending a lot of their time indoors up to 90 percent of, of our time we are spending indoors and i know it from personal experience being under not un, under a COVID lockdown but under a pollution lockdown so to say in delhi during the winter months um, while i was trying to uh, to to seal off the house to prevent the outdoor air pollution into the house if if um, if you can if you seal off too tightly uh, and if you combine moisture with uh, restriction or restricted air circulation and maybe no ventilation because ventilation was not uh, um, uh, part of the design of the house then you will create a very humid moist and very hostile environment and of course very harmful uh, and the ideal environment for the for the molds to grow. And I was astonished to see how fast this black mold could, could grow on, on the walls and then paintings and everything. So I really had to rethink about how to how to how to cope with this situation. This is particularly important in countries where um, we expect um, let's say if I just take the example of India, two thirds of of the buildings that will be present in 2050 have not really been built yet so there is a huge opportunity in the built environment to, to, uh, to make those design changes and the 
let's say, the future proofing of, of the zero buildings as well as as buildings that can provide uh, um, uh, a better uh, um, uh, indoor uh, air quality. Yeah, and, and from our point of view, from Siemens, we are not obviously a design company, uh, and we are a technology company, and, and what we truly believe, and I want to bring the topic of what Josh said about if ventilation is increasing, or we need more. Uh, we 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 need more ventilation. Then the energy cost will rise. And I want to bring the concept here of flexibility because you are right. Um, we need more ventilation, but we need less space. Yeah. So it's a balance of cost. So how does how do the building recognize that? How does the building recognize the occupancy in the most efficient way? Because uh, you cannot be the ventilation levels are less than what the uh, building is fully occupied so how we increase flexibility in our business in the way we use the buildings we keep comfort and obviously i, I must say and i want again to insist in the concept of digitalization and the concept of a smart building that pascal was talking about uh, because for us smart buildings of course is a efficient energy efficient building but as well as a building that uh, could provide more transparency about not only indoor uh, indoor uh, indoor uh, quality air quality but as well about personal conditions will have uh, a strong importance in the fight against uh, not only climate change but uh, well, uh, uh, health being uh, well uh, health and well-being conditions uh, so smart buildings are uh, connected buildings and that are that by the way will allow us to make more remote maintenance and predicting maintenance that will help us to reduce costs and reduce energy, and therefore uh, increase um, not only economic performance of the building, but as well indoor quality uh, conditions. So yeah, I mean, just insist in these two concepts of digitalization and therefore flexibility for the buildings. Yeah, so it, it, agreed. It, when we talk about indoor air quality, and, and obviously as Pascal and, and everyone has mentioned, that's that's your quick tie to net zero, right? If you can ensure good indoor air quality without having to use a lot of energy or using it smartly, as Augustine uh, so well, uh, so ably put it, 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 that's the tie, right? Because three keys to good indoor air quality, you need the correct ventilation for your space, right? Your space amounts, right? Um, so that's, uh, again, what Augustine mentioned, you know, you want to have a smart building and know your space space. Um, you need to have correct filtration so you can deal with things like Valentine was dealing with, right? The particulate matter levels. You want to make sure you have the correct uh, filtration levels uh, to catch the particulate matter that can be coming from the outside and potentially uh, but not too much because the your HVAC unit will be overtaxed, could break down, which is bad um, on multiple levels. And you're using more energy to suck the air through. The third and the one that we find most uh, helpful in indoor air quality, again, taking COVID out of the situation in a traditional sense, is source control. Control your sources, whether it be the particulate matter that's being used or the source of products on the indoor environment. So the off-gassing of chemicals that can come out improves human health. So again, there is that direct tie. If you're, if you're treating pe people better and the indoor environment from a human health and well-being perspective, you can use less energy. And if you're using less energy, it can directly tie to the human health. That that codependency is, I don't think any one of us, and I think across the board, please remember to ask. The one other thing I would mention, Katrina, in this area is the smart buildings that Augusta was talking about 
we need better sensors. And the uh, World Green Building Council put out a plant to sensor program earlier this year, which is a really important aspect about outdoor air, indoor air to understand what's going on. We've gotten really good at particular air level in air quality. Our sensors right now are always the best. Um, they need to be calibrated a lot. They fall out of operation. And the volatile organic compound level is standard for those. Reset has a standard also. Look at the World Green I tried. Josh, thank you. Um, I think there were a few audio connection issues there. I'm saying not, I wasn't sure if it was just me or not, but I think that we, we understood the bulk of what you were saying, and I'm very pleased with where you went with that for mentioning our plan to sensor program, so thank you. And in that question that we started talking about the co-benefits, um, and Pascal elaborated a little bit more, Valentin went into it more, we've gone into smart buildings too, but we also have touched on the areas where health and net zero do sometimes create tension points and challenges and I think it's great that we've got four experts sitting here because we need to address this and this is one of the dip biggest difficulties we have in aspiring for a sustainable built environment that is circular in its resource use and prioritizes net zero carbon across the whole life cycle operational and embodied and advances human health and well-being so We'll, we'll come on to the COVID side in a minute because that really links to the ventilation topic we were just talking about. But generally, can we can we shed some light on these areas that are that are tension points between health and well-being and net zero goals, and what can we do to address them? Uh, yeah, Katrina, if you allow me, um, one of the I mean, as you said, some of you in the in the call uh, two largest challenges we have in the companies to address our or to achieve our sustainability target is the, all the supply chain management uh, topic or processes and, and what is the role of, of, of carbon emissions uh, in the supply chain management. And uh, the other challenge we have is the decarbonization of, of our buildings, of our facilities. Yeah. So the, the, the very first two actions that companies are implementing to, to achieve the decarbonization target is basically is one is procuring energy coming from renewables, so procuring green energy, but more importantly, is reduce energy usage and optimize the space, use the space efficiently. The space is a big is a big cost in our company. So mm -hmm. without a proper monitoring and intelligent system or a smart system, these measures could derive in, for example, a wrong ventilation or, or wrong comfort conditions that are, or, or maybe an over-occupied spaces that at the end of the day is less productivity for 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 the, the, the company, right? So, and I want to bring again the concept of flexibility. So, buildings has to be able to be able to predict uh, and recognize when the maximum capacity will take place and, and and where and apply the right energy mix for that. And in the opposite, when the building is empty, uh, be able to to save and storage energy to be used in the right moment without compromising comfort conditions, which is at the end of the day the indoor quality topic. Yeah. So um, answer for this is the, the we think the answer for this is digitalization and, and, and sensor technologies as Josh was mentioning before and we have a strong development in the last years about the quality and the capabilities of all, all these sensors all these technologies and as well monitoring energy so really have the transparency of what's going on in our buildings that allows us uh, and the building to really react in, in lifetime or at least as soon as possible to external threats in the most efficient way. Thank you for, uh, thank you Augustine for also bringing up this uh, issue about renewable energy uh, in, in terms of how to operate these, uh, these uh, smart buildings. Mm. I think there is, there is a tension there with renewable energy and uh, you may remember um, the debates in, in Europe uh, uh, some years ago, not too, not too far ago, about uh, wood stoves and the, how popular they became in Central and Northern Europe uh, in terms of their carbon footprint. They, are, they were, and they are, some are still considering them um, 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 renewable uh, energy solution. We do have, of course, uh, a lower uh, carbon footprint from 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 those uh, those uh, sources, but at the same time, which we we compromise a lot on 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 the pollution issue, and uh, and we have seen actually now 
in, in recent years translating into the into the trends of, uh, of the statistics of, of air pollutants, traditional air pollutants I'm talking about, in terms of increased um, uh, uh, concentration levels in, in the um, uh, uh, in the outdoor uh, air, but also in the indoor air, there is uh, uh, some uh, higher exposure of, 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 of the people that are exposed uh, to, um, to those kind of sources indoors. So the built environment is is really um, um, up to a challenge here to, to make sure that the the sources, the energy sources that are, are being chosen here, either within the built environment or outside, uh, that uh, that is driving um, 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 the the operation of the of the zero energy uh, zero uh, emissions buildings. We 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 really need to have a look at it and 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 consider it a, a potential trade off at least and and oh. and, and factor in this this uh, particular situation, which otherwise we know will create that we have a particulate matter, fine particulate matter pollution. We also have the VOCs from uh, from some of the materials that we haven't discussed it here yet, uh, uh, from from buildings that may also uh, create uh, particulates and may also be uh, toxic for uh, humans. There are certain trade-offs that that need to be managed. They are not huge. I would I would say that that's nothing that we cannot overcome. But um, we we need to look uh, um, uh, more holistically into into both the carbon footprint, but also other pollutants footprint from 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 the sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, bringing up good points there, and I'll go directly to the VOCs, Valentine. I don't think that's shocking to anyone. Katrina certainly won't won't find it shocking. She's heard me talk about VOC emissions far too much over the last. 12 months. Um, but when when we have organizations like St. Coban who are sealing up buildings so well for us, right? That allows us to reach some of those net zero goals because we automate again, taking COVID out of the situation, which is dang near impossible in 2020. But we we get to lower our ventilation rates because we're sealing up the building so well. So we don't need to heat and cool as much. We don't need to take in as much air. So we're sealing those buildings up, which then can lead to the source control being the main problem because you're not able to get those volatile organic compounds and those aldehydes, formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, uh, ethylene glycols that are coming off man-made products. Um, mm -hmm. Again, these chemicals aren't necessarily bad outright, right? They help us make better products, right? They help us make us longer lasting products, more recyclable, cheaper, uh, more sustainable in total, but we also need to balance that with how we're impacted inside. So that, that potential negative impact is that net zero. We get down to net zero by sealing up our buildings well, using as little ventilation as possible, you know, uh, uh, not turning on as many lights, not plugging in as many eye whatevers um, into the walls. That's all great. But when we do parts of that, the indoor air can become a problem. Um, again, the exposure to these chemicals lead to much higher asthma rates. I know here in North America, asthma rates are up about 160% over the last decade throughout Asia, it's become a major problem. Some of that is also due to the particulate matter that we're dealing with like Valentina it's stating both outdoors and in, in indoors in some areas. But a lot of it is also due to volatile organic compound exposure. Even in utero, uh, we're seeing exposures, uh, studies out of Northern Europe that are showing that in utero exposure to VOC, higher levels of VOCs can lead to asthma development in the child. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, it, it's tricky there. Want to, again, it's that balancing act, right, that Pascal talked about earlier. We need to balance everything we can for that, uh, the, the, the person who used to do the plates on the little stands. Um, it feels like we're doing that sometimes, but we can get better. Uh, well, well. Since you are talking of me, Josh, let me let me answer to to those points. So I think yes, there is a, a challenge in terms of design, and uh, and uh, for for the designer, things are becoming more and more complex. Uh, uh, it's not because you have solved part of the issues that everything has been solved. So um, to avoid having uh, uh, 
negative effects uh, because of more airtightness, uh, uh, reduced ventilation rates, we need to make sure that buildings have been properly designed. So uh, there is a, a, still a real challenge in terms of education to make sure that those who design buildings do it properly, so they know what they are, they are doing. And Valentin mentioned uh, an example of a building with a poor uh, uh, ventilation. Unfortunately, this happens still too often, especially in renovation. So we need to make sure that uh, there is a good education of, of buildings designer. We need to make sure that they have also access to, to transparent information. You're right, Josh. Uh, uh, we need to be transparent on the, on the emissions coming from products from construction products for sure, but also from uh, any kind of product that is being used inside the building. So this transparency is, uh, is very important and uh, things need to be measured. So this is where uh, sensors and uh, active technologies make sense. So I, I don't think there is, a, there used to be traditionally some, some kind of uh, opposition between uh, should we go for the building envelope or should we go for digitalization i think to, uh, we need to go for both we need both digitalization need to to have a good a well insulated business, uh, building because it it gives resilience and digitalization will uh, will work even better if there is a a, a, a good uh, resilience uh, uh, of the building so we we need to to work on this complementarity again it's a design challenge and we need to, not to oppose things but on, on the contrary we need to take the, the the most out of the the benefits of all those new technologies and um, I, I think uh, Technologies are very important uh, for the users, uh, and this is where possibly we, we still need to have a, a, a big step to, to, to make, uh, which is to, to, to help uh, building occupants and building users to make a, a better use of that building. So it's about flexibility, it's about occupancy, but it's also about knowing how to, to best use uh, the different technologies, what to do at what time to make sure that energy is saved, but also that uh, the, uh, there is no pollution inside, that uh, nothing is made that will be detrimental. And, um, and uh, we definitely lack uh, uh, information toward buildings occupant. And uh, again, technologies will help, but uh, we need to accelerate on that. Pascal, thank you. And I mean, you, you're you're teeing up exactly the work that we, as in all all five of us, all five of our organisations have been doing in partnership to try and increase the amount of information that is is available to educate people on on this topic. And I'll point later towards the the framework that we are pulling together to do this. But if I can come back to Josh's statement of let's take COVID off the table. We're going to flip that. We're going to unfortunately now put this into our current context of mid-global pandemic. And I'm going to ask our uh, I'm going to ask our experts a question, but I don't want their response yet because I would like to hear from the audience too. So the question is going to be about whether the COVID-19 pandemic is helping us to move towards action on climate change or whether it's hindering it. So audience, get thinking too while I ask you this because. On one side, we have we have the Build Back Better campaign. We have global increased recognition of the fact that we have social, environmental, economic challenges that unite us all all over the world. We're seeing increased traction and conversation about climate change. But on the other hand, we've talked about it already. We also have ventilation requirements, air filtration requirements, heightened use of air conditioning, um, a reduction in the use of some of the more energy efficient HVAC technologies that can possibly lead to a heightened use of energy, which moves away from our net zero carbon goals and away from our climate action targets. So the poll question is for everybody here, which I'm going to launch now, is has the coronavirus pandemic heightened or hindered action on climate change? I'm going to leave this open for 30 seconds, then we'll have a look at the responses and then I'm going to go to our panellists to answer this. And I'll come to Josh first. Just a few more seconds for those of you voting on the poll. It is very substantially weighted in one direction. I have to say I'm slightly surprised. I thought it was going to be more balanced than this. Let's wrap it up in a few more seconds. 
Okay, thank you all of you who have voted. Let's share these results. So 88% of people on this, on this webinar today think that awareness and action is greater now than pre-COVID. Experts, what do you think? Josh, over to you. Yeah, so um, my answer, unfortunately, at the moment is I think awareness and action depends on where you live. Um, I think most people, by my accent, realize I live in the United States of America. Um, so it kind of depends on who your fellow citizens um, elected. Um, awareness is certainly still there and, and, and uh, certainly growing with our major wildfires in the western part of the United States, adding to the wildfires that are happening around the world over the last year. Action, again, is, is, is not happening, unfortunately. The United States has taken a step back. Pre-COVID, post-COVID, COVID, COVID. Um, <laughs> Oh, Josh, I think we might have just lost you there. <laughs> just as he was starting to insult the United States, he's mysteriously <laughs> disappeared. Let's not read into that too much. Uh, let me come to one of our other panelists. We'll see if Josh can connect back in. Valentin? Yeah, I can I can definitely subscribe to also to this result of the poll. I think uh, my personal observation and organization that I belong to is that the, this, the time of, of restrictions for many of us uh, during the crisis, the COVID crisis, um, has been a time of reflection, but also of communication with the governments and the institutions and pub uh, public and private sector, I would say, both, um, in terms of, of bringing up the, uh, the, the benefits and co-benefits of, of the different types of solutions that can be applied have we 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 feel that we have been listened to more than before and we may have become um, uh, more successful in persuading the governments also to take more action or they have just come to that conclusion themselves uh, which is also um, a good thing um, I mean I feel that this has happened inevitably um uh, this um, it was i see this as, as as an opportunity that we managed well and now we will need to see the results of, of this of course uh, that the governments and at all levels will be taking uh, the this action i think the commitment is there i feel that there's been a lot of momentum and uh, and um the the, the green uh, um, trend that we have experienced uh, over the last months, uh, the narrative uh, of uh, tackling both climate change, air pollution, and and other environmental uh, problems is going to continue, definitely for a while. But we really need to uh, to to go now from words to uh, to action and see that uh, something is happening on the ground and. and um, uh, the results will be, of course, uh, the outcomes will be seen later. But I think this is this was uh, an opportunity. Uh, the the crisis gave rise to uh, an opportunity to to um, revamp, if you may, if you may say, the action on climate change as well. Valentin, thank you. Just before we go to Pascal and Agustin, I want to pick up some of the comments that are coming in and the questions in the chat box. There's an interesting comment saying that awareness is greater now, but action is lower due to the impact of COVID on companies' financial positions. Yes. Pascal, you're nodding. Do you want to give us the European perspective? Well, th th this is what I wanted to say, that uh, clearly awareness uh, has increased and uh, and I think that uh, everybody recognized uh, the need to to, to act uh, against climate change. When it comes to action, it's uh, <laughs> it's the, the the situation is a bit more uh, how to say um, 
balanced. So you have clearly, uh, at, well, if you look, if we look at Europe uh, at political level, I think we have made a huge step forward. So uh, uh, the plan of the European Union, what has been communicated uh, uh, last week by uh, uh, President von der Leyen regarding uh, the, the new objective of, of, uh, of Europe in terms of carbon emission, this is great. So I think we have achieved things that we were dreaming of since years, and uh, we are politically thinking are making a huge step forward. Um, politically, the recognition also that uh, actions against climate change can um, can be good in terms of job creation, in terms of uh, uh, economic recovery, it's there as well. I'm a bit more puzzled when it comes to the uh, uh, citizen level. I'm not sure that uh, all citizens have uh, understood uh, what actions at their level will mean. So they are conscious that uh, things need to happen globally, but when it comes to single responsibility, it's not always there. And when it comes to what I can do at, for my building or in my building, then I'm even more skeptical. So people are, if you ask uh, people what, what to do against climate change, they will say, uh, I will uh, not go by car or by plane, I will, uh, I will bike, I will, uh, I will eat less meat or these kind of things. Uh, I'm not so sure that buildings will come uh, top of mind and uh, in terms of action that uh, people will be prepared to invest in their buildings. So it means that uh, there will be some needs for, again, education, information and financial incentives to, to turn the uh, global uh, willingness to do something into actions specifically in the building sector. Mm. Yeah. And, and to answer the question to, to how to stay on track on with, with uh, net zero buildings while we mitigate uh, all the risks regarding uh, COVID and the pandemic, I think from, from our perspective, from our company perspective, uh, I think it was a challenge, but it was a, as well an opportunity. I mean, for instance, to talk about uh, our products and our solutions, uh, it was a, really a push uh, to all these uh, pandemic topic to really increase our, let's say, capabilities to, uh, to create or to innovate in different solutions that, we, that already exist in the market and to develop certain tools and applications that really um, uh, focus on the user. I think that the main challenge in, in all this, uh, let's say, revolution and, and the COVID really goes in that direction is put the user in the center. So, I mean, for instance, uh, in our company, we uh, roll out a, a, an application that really try to put together comfort and health and comfort and um, risk mitigation about the, uh, the COVID-19. Um, and yeah, I mean, for, for instance, we are using an, an, an app that um, really track all the access control of the employee is really they help them to personalize the comfort conditions in the most efficient way. The lighting levels, the ventilation levels, obviously there are some conflicts in the <laughs> privacy, but uh, is is already short. Uh, depending on the countries, but uh, yeah, but if you want to increase flexibility, you really need to focus on the user. And I think that nowadays technology allows that. The only thing is that we need to roll it out in, in, in different uh, levels of activities. Um, but I think that putting the user of the citizen in the center is really the question. And yeah, you are right. The awareness is there and we need to provide the right tools and service and uh, and, and, and capabilities that I think that I think that nowadays the development have been so so uh, increased so uh, so fast uh, so far. Thank you all. Um, we are being flooded with some brilliant questions here. I think that poll has got people feeling interactive. So uh, we'll we'll pick up as a few of these questions just now before coming to our panelists for their final remarks. Uh, Agustin, I'm going to um, pose this question towards you first. I think it's going to be an easy answer for you, but let's hear your let's hear your response to it. Our question <laughs> is: With the current pandemic, does the panel think the green buildings should give more emphasis on using sensors and IoT technology for better indoor air quality monitoring, for better control and energy saving measures? 
Mm, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I think it's a very good opportunity to to acknowledge and create awareness about uh, what role uh, buildings and infrastructure are playing in our daily life. Yeah, and now, and how can we use them in a way that help us to be safer, healthier, and energy responsible? Right. So we comprise the whole topics that we are discussing today. Yeah, and in this new reality, let's say it's, it's really a good moment to increase transparency and increase digitalization. Yeah, uh, in old buildings it may look is more complicated than in greenfield buildings that, that's true but nowadays all these sensor technologies and and overall the iot technology um can help companies and building owners really to and users uh, to to with a little a little effort to improve the indoor quality and the tracking and traceability of 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 the products uh, and individuals and of course increase energy consumption therefore uh carbon emissions so yeah i think honestly it's, it's a good moment to really increase the digitalization capabilities and uh, policy makers are pushing this with the green deal uh, a green deal will i think will have a big push uh independently of the COVID 19 topic so yeah of course i think it's a good moment thanks agustin that question was perfect for you and i'm going to come to our other panelists in a second but i want to add add in uh, a point from another question we have saying what is the general feeling towards increased natural ventilation in buildings where pollution and local climate allows is it more pure natural ventilation as an approach we want or should we be looking at hybrid or mixed mode uh, tomlin who sent in this question says that existing mechanical systems don't seem to fit well in a post-pandemic world and increased filtration adds further energy load anyone hmm. want to comment on that obviously very complex on a global level to make a statement about a universal ventilation strategy but perhaps uh, i'll share while you're all thinking that perhaps you've seen the world health organization guidance that touches on ventilation in terms of covid 19 as a as a strategy for preventing transmission of disease and that does point towards natural ventilation where safe and feasible so i guess that's the question should we be should we be promoting that vent now so it depends. Um, <laughs> that's the awful thing. Um, Pascal mentioned it earlier. Your designers, your engineers need to understand the situation. Um, it, it, Valentin mentioned, you know, in certain areas of the world, you bring more natural air in, whether through natural ventilation or outdoor air in, through natural ventilation mm -hmm. or HVAC systems, you're going to have mold and moisture problems, which are going to lead to more significant health issues, right? So you can't say, one size fits all. It just doesn't, unfortunately. I, I I wish it was. This would make it a heck of a lot more easier. And additionally, if someone has COVID and they're sitting in front of your natural ventilation open window and you're downstream of them, you're still going to get COVID, whether it's an HVAC vent or an open window. If it's blowing, it's blowing COVID towards you or pandemic X or whatever we want to call it. So it's you can't outright blame the HVAC systems uh, for this. There's a solution in HVAC, there's a solution for natural, and there's a solution for, for co-working it together. And there's I a solution a... also, yeah, sorry. Yes. Please, please, Valentin, please. No, I was just, you know, again, with my experience from India, of course, uh, ventilation has to be coupled with filtration, heavy filtration of particulates. And this has been achieved, so it's, it's definitely doable. You have schools in India where probably children are, are uh, breathing better air than in Europe, uh, thanks to that filtration and, and high ventilation rates. But it, that comes with a cost. That comes with a cost to our society in terms of the energy that has been used. And maybe that energy, if it's not been renewable and not been optimized for, for this uh, for this they then uh, uh, that will may create other problems but uh, overall yeah there is no uh, no solution fits all and then yeah you will have to to see um, each individual case um, as, as such and it's it is complex but it's it's doable in all cases But just to, to complement, I think it's, uh, I fully agree with Josh that it, there is no one fit all solution. Uh, take acoustic, for instance, if you are in a noisy neighborhood, uh, natural ventilation may be very painful for, for, for people. And we have seen, uh, unfortunately, lots of buildings where people uh, uh, 
uh, have um, uh, manually uh, stop the systems to to open and close the windows just to 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 keep in control of the noise. So uh, again, it's uh, it's case by case. You you can't have a, a general rule. Just coming back on, on the question of uh, if we have more ventilation because of COVID, we will increase uh, the consumption of energy. I just wanted to to give you. Uh, um, one result of uh, some experiments we, we did. If you have a very well insulated building, a building where uh, the walls uh, can keep, a, uh, the surface of the wall keep uh, uh, a very stable temperature, where you have a complete absence of droughts, then an, uh, an improved uh, humidity control, then um, this uh, increased level of ventilation can be compensated by uh, a reduced temperature. So people will still feel comfortable even if you lower the temperature by a, a few degrees in winter or if you leave it uh, uh, go uh, a few degrees higher in, in summer, they will not feel uncomfortable because uh, uh, of the different points I, I have mentioned before. So I think uh, in very well performing buildings, uh, you can compensate this over uh, ventilation by, uh, by the fact that uh, your envelope is highly performing. So this mm -hmm. is also a point to be taken into account at this end stage. You will not necessarily consume much more energy in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we'll finish off with one last question and then we'll come on to panelists' final remarks. But Pascal, you touched there on acoustics, which was an area of health and well-being that we haven't we haven't got into in this conversation. And and we would need another six hours of this webinar, wouldn't we, to cover all the areas of health and well-being in the built environment that we could. But we've had a question specifically about water quality, um, saying that a lot of this conversation has been about air quality naturally and particularly relevant at this current moment. And the question is that in the future, would water quality not be on the same level of priority as air quality for maximizing standards of living? What do you think? Katrina, yeah. into the future. No, but it, it, it shouldn't be a future thing. It should be now. Um, water quality is incredibly important. Um, it, it, and it's directly tied with energy. Um, I once heard someone say a little bit exaggerating, but you use almost as much energy out of your taps as you do out of your plugs, right? Meaning we, we move water around the world through power. We filter water around the world through power. Um, so they're still directly tied, right? And, and water quality is a massive issue. Believe it or not, water quality is a huge issue right now due to COVID-19. Uh, buildings going into reoccupancy, our biggest concern with those buildings isn't necessarily that they're filled with COVID viruses and they're going to attack you the moment you walk into a building. That's not realistic. But it's all these water systems that have been dead uh, essentially for six months. You're turning these water systems back on and you've got Legionella concerns, other bacterium concerns. Uh, we're seeing elevated rates of bacteria and, and Legionella in buildings that are going to reoccupy. The number one thing I would tell people, uh, 1B, I guess, 1A, make sure your ventilation system's correct. 1B would be run the heck out of your hot water before you reoccupy your building uh, because the water systems are where the concern are. So uh, it shouldn't be a future thing. It should be now. Um, you know, water and air directly impact us every day. We have all these food regulations on a global basis. Where the heck are all the water and air quality uh, regulations that we, we need? Thanks, Josh. That's a great point. Um, unless any of the other speakers come in, I want to ask one more. I know I said I wouldn't, but this is too good a question not to. And thank you, Kevin, for asking this. And Valentin, we'll, we'll come to you first on this because it's picking up on, on, I guess, some of your experience of, of living in India. And we're talking about the school example in India begs the question of how do we make our efforts to improve human health in indoor environments equitable? In that example, those who can afford good filtration for indoor air benefit, mm -hmm. but they're indirectly contributing to decreasing outdoor air quality which impacts the rest of society. How do we make sure it isn't only the rich who can afford clean air? Well, I would say um, this is our, our mission in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, precisely this mission, to 
is to bring um, cleaner air uh, to um, to the to the more unfortunate of us that that cannot afford um, other solutions, other technical solutions to filtrate uh, their air. There is also a parallel here to water, of course. Um, the solutions to that are, are, of course, reducing emissions at source and and reduce the depend dependence on um, fossil fuels that, that are now powering uh, 80 up to I think 82 percent of our uh, global energy system. Um, that that would be the main the, the main um, trigger of, of better air for everyone everyone um, around the planet. Uh, they we will all benefit from that uh, from from greening the economies and greening the the energy sector. That is one one main contribution that we can bring through uh, and through the action of the governments. Of course, this takes a lot of a lot of of um, commitments, but also a lot of investment from the governments and, and infrastructure investments for the future. Um, when it comes to um, buildings, I would say um, we really need to look at the societal, uh, societal I think it's called uh, trends, and and um, the trends that. Um, many more people and a lot of the people that have been lived out of poverty um they are requiring now strong uh, stronger uh, a bigger floor area um and so that creates a demand on on um, on on the buildings on building materials but also on uh, on on uh, creates a pressure on on this population expa expansion in on a, on a on a bigger floor area i, I would say so while we create efficiency improvements uh, and we continue to make those efficiency gains uh, in energy efficiency if i don't think we have enough or adequate um, uh, compensation for to outpace the demand growth buildings and floor area and that with that comes uh, energy demand so this is something for us to to think about and could, to continue to innovate within and, uh, and um, Try to uh, to uh, always be a step ahead of the of the uh, population trends and and the trends in different sectors. Valentin, thank you. Does anybody else want to come in on that? I think Valentin summed it up beautifully, and we are we're moving towards the end of this session anyway. So. Speakers, we have covered an incredible realm of topics there, um, as, as we expected, and more everything from co-benefits to tensions to global politics to global pandemics, smart buildings and everything in between. And I'm going to ask each of you to try and sum up your key takeaway for this audience, please, in if you can, in one sentence. And who will I be so mean to pick on first? Um, Valentin, may I come to you first for your key takeaway for the audience today? Well, I, my, my key takeaway is, I would say, um, it's it's the, the, the climate positive actions that have been um, discussed and uh, here in, in this panel, um that we can consider and uh, that i see them being part of building back these uh, all our economies and societies and communities and uh, the building sector is uh, fundamental to our our um, our lives we we spend uh, time in the built environment we spend time in in our homes in schools in offices um so um Having uh, an, an environment that um, that um, at the same time is, is not creating a, 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 an impact on, on climate or or generally on uh, on 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 environment, I think uh, that this is uh, what we we should all strive for. So um, um, I fully submit to uh, to uh, to the 
also the mission of of, of the um, uh, of the World Green Building Council, and I would also like to congratulate you for for all your accomplishments, and also uh, internationally, but also at the national level, uh, a lot of uh, good recommendations are being taken. Uh, um, and and I being promoted um, in in by the by the national councils, which I I, I found extremely useful in the societies around. Thank you, Valentin. I would say that was two key takeaways. But given that one of them was complementary to the national GBCs, we'll let you have that. Thank you, Agustin. Can I come to you next, please? Yeah, I mean, um, looking at the title and, and doing kind of a brief summary of, of, of the, our talk today and net, net zero, I would say decarbonization topic of the net zero building concept and, and health are will be not really interconnected. I mean, you cannot see them as an isolated topics uh, independently because comfort and, and health will be in are energy intensive actions. So and it impacts directly in the, in the decarbonization and the emission of uh, CO2 emissions of the company. So our solution, our proposal is uh, digitalization, increased fle flexibility and transparency. And I think, with, uh, and, and I insist again, with a little effort, you can increase uh, uh, tremendously your efficiency in your buildings and that will impact in the user, which we should put in the center of all these initiatives. So this is my key takeaway. Thank you. Pascal? Well, um, I, I fully agree that uh, uh, when we talk about sustainability in the built environment, we, we need to, to, to remind that uh, uh, the carbon issue and the health and well-being topics are uh, fully compatible and work hand in hand. We shouldn't forget about circularity. It was not mentioned today, but clearly this is uh, the third pillar and it is also very important. So these are the three topics that need to be pushed uh, forward. Um, I would like to insist that it is not just about new build, it's also about the renovation of existing buildings and in some regions where we have already uh, uh, the existing buildings of the future, uh, typically Europe, we need to address the existing building and renovation is, is, is clearly uh, also a priority. The solutions exist, we have seen, uh, and uh, we need to, to, to play the, 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 the right complementarity uh, between those different solutions. And this is where uh, a good education of, uh, of designers plays a role. We need also to secure that there is a good installation of those solutions because we have, uh, uh, if uh, on the digital side or on the envelope side, we have great solutions, but if they are not well installed, they will not deliver. So instead, uh, the, the training of installers is also something that is very important. And uh, we have not touched uh, the topic of regulation, but uh, I think if we want to accelerate in terms of, uh, of implementation, we need also to have uh, better regulation. So at some stage, uh, the voluntary approach is not enough anymore. Uh, it's good to have stakeholders uh, working together on pilot projects. But if we want to scale up, we need good regulations. And uh, we can uh, get access uh, to, to better regulation. We can convince policymakers to elaborate better regulation if we have uh, also a coordinated approach to that. So I think uh, uh, the GBCs uh, bringing together all the stakeholders are very powerful to convince uh, policymakers to, to move forward. Uh, we can bring good examples that things work, technologies exist, it delivers, it pays back, so it's time to, to scale up by uh, implementing uh, better regulations. Thank you, Pascal. And finally, Josh. Yeah, first, um, I'm honored to be on this panel with, with the four of you. Um, I've learned something just in the last hour and a half speaking with each of you, so um, thank you so much. Um, to pick up on what Pascal is saying, you need to vote at the ballot box for um, carbon reduction and for human health focus. That's what we need to do. But you're not just voting at the ballot box. Those that can, vote with your dollars. Purchase from organizations that are focused on reducing carbon while also improving human health, right? You can vote at the ballot box to get that regulation, but also the return on investment that companies see, they're going to start investing more if they're seeing dollars come back. So those are the key takeaways. 
Brilliant, thank you for very diverse but powerful takeaways. And on behalf of the audience and of the World GBC team, thank you so much to our four expert speakers, Pascal, Agustin, Valentin, Josh, for your incredible insights today. It's been an honor to moderate this session. I think we could have conceivably gone on for many hours longer and picked up all the areas of health and well-being, but we'll leave that for another day. So thank you very much for your contributions. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank, thank you. you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, everyone. Thank you, panelists. So just a few just a few closing words from me before we finish off this webinar today. Uh, don't forget, as I mentioned, you can join our call to action by endorsing our statement and you can support the campaign to accelerate net zero buildings through policy. It was Pascal's key takeaway. You can help to do it on the World GBC website. So join our call to action statement now. And finally, thank you very much to all of you for joining this important discussion today. Thank you very much for the questions. We had a huge number flooding in at the end, so I apologize we couldn't get to them all, but um, we, we got through as many as we can. So thank you for your engagement in today's session and in World Green Building Week generally. Please do remember there are three more sessions coming up through the Spotlight series this week, so do check them out. And as I mentioned, our work on health and well-being that we have been working as a global network for close to two years now will be released on the 4th of November. So please do stay tuned through the World GBC channels to find out more about the health and well-being framework and be part of that launch session too. So thank you very much again to all of you. And a key takeaway from me is that we, we must act on climate for our sector. And for our sector, net zero buildings are the answer to human and planetary health. So thank you all very much for your attention. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.